Okay, this is the Polgar vs Topoz game of 2006. Polgar playing white plays e4, and Topov responds with his Sicilian fence favourite. Some standard moves here, and bishop e3 was played, which might be going into the English attack system with f3 and queen d2, but after e6, which is a Chavin England pawn structure, um, known for this little centre pawns here. Um, Susan Holgar plays the very aggressive g4, which is the Carer's attack, named after the Estonian grandmaster Paul Cat, who was a very fine player, a world championship contender, in fact. After h6, Susan now plays a semi positional move, bishop g2. So, taking time to reinforce her position, the e4 square, and still reserving options like h4, f4 later to perhaps pursue a plan with g5 to chase the knight from f6, and then maybe even like f5 later. Top of plays g5 though, which in one stroke tries to discourage f4 or h4, and also Potentially, he's preparing um, a knight outpost on e5 without being interrupted by f4 to dislodge the knight, which we'll see later. Queen e2, knight d7, castles queenside. And you'll notice black's position is kind of fragile tactically because there is, in theory, there's this d6 pawn on semi open file. But in practice, it's sort of hard to get to. Um, Another potential target is, is this g5, though. If, if black did castle kingside later, h4 is going to be very dangerous. So, Topol's king is a bit in a precarious situation so far in this game. Um, he played knight e5, though, which is consistent with this g5 idea, to have this nice outpost on e5, which is difficult to dislodge. h3 was played, now knight fd7, reinforcing e5. Still keeping the bishop protecting d6 just in case it's needed there. Um, but there's still the question, you know, where is black going to castle? f4 is played. So Susan doesn't mind her e-pawn being isolated because she probably feels the dynamic compensation in the f-file. It justifies it. After g takes, bishop takes, b5 is now played, which is a sort of thematic move in, in this um, opening. Because the bishop can naturally go to b7 on the beautiful fianchetto, and that sometimes works very well with later b4 to dislodge the defensive knight of e4. So this whole idea of b5 can end up putting a lot of pressure on e4 in some variations. So Susan has to be careful here. First, she plays rook hf1. So already, you know, there's some sensations of pressure on this semi-open f file. Um, and black plays bishop b7. Now, Susan plays a beautiful little move here, queen f2. It's a dual purpose move because not only potentially the queen can come to g3 or h4 later if the queen was not on d8, um, it also vacates the e2 square. So this knight, instead of retreating awkwardly if black plays b4, say to a4 or b1, can come to e2 and perhaps from e2 to g3 and then come in front of this isolated h pawn here. And that would be quite dangerous for black if there was a knight here because these dark squares would, would be pressurised. Um, and this is actually what occurred in the game. After rook c8, knight e2, straight away, not even waiting for b4, just pursuing this manoeuvre in its own right. Bishop g7, knight g3, rook h7, rather awkward move. And in post-mortem analysis, this game it, it's shown that this move is, is tactically um, exploitable. Because after knight h5, bishop h8, first of all, white played king b1. And we reach a critical position now where the exploitable uh, ability of this rook is, is emphasized because knight c5, and in post mortem, the, there was a stunning move here which was, was missed, which could have led to an incredibly quick knockout blow for Toplov. Um, I'll give you five seconds to see if you can see it. Five, four, three, two, one. The move which Susan Polgar missed was knight f5.
which actually her sister commenting on, on, on a blog on the internet found in real time during the game um, the, the principal idea is that after E takes Bishop takes Bishop takes Queen takes F is very embarrassing for black there's no Queen G5 check so the king's not on C1 and where does this rook go? It can't go to H8 because of Queen F7 so black ends up losing material e.g. Queen G5, Queen H7 is virtually a lost position but anyway, that, that didn't occur in the game. Instead, Susan missed this uh, fantastic resource. Um, but played still a strong move, Bishop G3, which is a position he found it, to try and get in on these dark squares. This lovely little manoeuvre here gets in on these dark squares and potentially to try and exchange off this dark square bishop so these squares have even more accessibility for, for White's uh, knight and other pieces. And this does show to be decisive later on, as we'll see. So here the move, knight takes e4 was played. So Susan didn't mind this pawn being used as a pawn sector because it does open up another line against black's king, potentially. But first, there's the dark square attack, which we'll, we'll see now with bishop f6. So the dark squares are being weakened in black's position. And now Susan plays knight f6 check, reaping the gains of uh, the dark square bishop exchange. And you'll notice here that Queen H4 is, is now a latent threat in position. But before doing this, Susan makes time for playing H4 to gain a bit of space and to fix this pawn on H6 if this pawn comes to H5. Queen C5, H5 now. And now, Queen H4. And then all of a sudden, there's a very dangerous threat of Knight D5 check in Queen E7. And it's not so easy for Black to escape this. Um... For example, if king c7, you would think this is a natural move to try and escape to the queen side. You will see that knight takes h7, rook takes, there's rook takes f7 as a massive blow. Because if rook takes f7, knight takes e6, full king, king, and queen, with big material advantage. So this isn't so easy to escape. So it's a, so far it's a triumph of this dark square strategy, which uh, Susan's been playing for all the dark squares with these subtle manoeuvres. Um, Topov plays bishop takes c2 here, and after um, knight takes c2, um, queen takes c2 was played. But maybe Susan e even had a stronger move here of simply king a1. Because if, for example, bishop takes d1, then knight d5 check is actually Believe it or not, it's a, it's a mate in uh, two. If f6, queen takes f6, king d7, queen e7. So, so this is also this another very interesting continuation. Would have just simply been here, king a1. And for example, again, if if black king tries to escape, um, now of course there's no knight h7s now. But there is knight takes c2 here, rather embarrassing for black, because if queen takes c2, then rook c1 is skewering the queen and king. So this was another fine opportunity, which uh, Susan's playing with the mouse, so to speak, but the mouse is um, the mighty Toplov. So um, she just plays king a1. Nevertheless, you don't have to play perfectly, and especially in over the board chess. Um, you just have to play good moves sometimes, even if you are playing a 2700 opponent, as this game shows. So Topolov plays king c7, and now Susan plays knight takes c2, um, and Topolov can't, um, pa pardon me, after bishop takes c2 check, the, the game continuation was actually just knight takes c2, queen takes c2, king a1, and now rook c4. Now this is still a very dangerous position for the black king. And Susan played knight e4 check. And she's coming in with the queen potentially in some lines. Uh, but also the d6 you'll see is now and pre, which Susan pounces on. And after rook f4 comes in with the queen. The queen and knight combination is very dangerous and is often decisive. And this game is no exception to that. Now here, instead of say rook e1, Susan plays a very clinical move, queen a7, beautiful, beautiful little move, 